Breakfast puppies? Welcome to Have Movies Will Game, the only podcast on the globe where we take you, our friendly listener, through the best and worst movies of yesterday and today, and then discuss ways that you can play them at your gaming table. In every episode, our intrepid hosts, Matthew, Dusty, and Nathaniel, will filibuster fondly over facts and feelings of your favorite films, and then get to the glorious gaming goodness, giving game masters great gimmicks on generating golden genius. Have Movies Will Game, brought to you through the electronic wonder of the internet. Now, let's start the show! new review this podcast saved my marriage exclamation point <laughs> dr phil useless dr ruth old news nathaniel dusty and matthew will teach you how to open your heart and how to love yourself they also talk about movies <laughs> that's great that's from the scrag the scrag oh, the scrag the scrag yeah. but hey the scrag i don't know if you've noticed this uh throughout our podcast but uh, i get top billing it's matthew dusty and nathaniel <laughs> that that's that's just that's no it's, it's it works. matthew dusty and nathaniel yeah. and you're uh, listening to half movies will game and we actually have a very special guest in the house today oh very special Thank very you. special mm-hmm. this is poppy beaujolais for a very special episode very of half special movies will game very, yeah very special episode i was just happy that i'm still in second billing so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i stayed how the, the hell same. did that work out <laughs> I just get guest credit, which is okay. So uh, this time we're doing the uh, the adventures of uh, fucking Beat Natty, Natty oh. Bumpo. Oh, Natty Bumpo. Yeah, yeah Natty yeah. Bumpo. That's right. Uh, Last of the Mohicans, 1992. Autumn and remember, of 1992, yes. Once again, if you haven't seen it, what rock have you been living under? But also there are spoilers. Seriously, like you you could drink it's, for five years now. You're 26? 27? This 26. came out in 92. Yeah. Yeah. Autumn yeah, of yeah. 92. Yeah, this movie is older enough Jessica, to drink. Jessica, uh, for a while, Jessica <laughs> has yeah. not seen this movie. I'm like, oh, wow. where yeah. were you? And she said, I was in diapers. And I went, I am a horrible man. <laughs> well, you found her. I did. Yeah. 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 Everybody got their uh, leather stockings on. Oh, good so th- this this actually has been adapted nine films. This yeah. has been done. But they were all really yes. shit. Well, not nine films. It was like four films and a whole bunch of TV movies. No, no nine. Nine full films. Are you uh, counting the West German ones? Four TV Nobody movies. Nobody counts the West German ones. Assorted radio broadcasts. And the director of Michael the West Mann, German ones. Uh, said that he was inspired to make this version from watching the 1936 version as a child. Yes, the West German one. The West German one. <laughs> it's true. Um, yeah. This actually is one of those uh, rare movies that is way better than the book. I would agree. Um, I was, you know, my, my my dad made me sit down and read these, and they were all, all right. The all entire leather stocking series? Yeah. Oh, wow. I thought there was only like three books. No, it, like it ends a oh. hundred years later with oh. The Prairie. <laughs> Okay. So, I mean, it, it's, Is not, it still it's not Natty Bumpo. Yeah. I'm 100 years old in a prayer. No, they just okay. kind of time shifted and okay. suddenly he's there 100 years later. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, um, so basically, the author writing himself into the novels kind of thing, maybe? Or maybe um, his, his... It, it was kind of an everyman. He was kind of okay. uh, a, a Daniel Boone. John McClane. Yeah. 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 Okay. All he's, right, Poppy, you said this was your favorite movie. This is my favorite movie of all time for a couple of reasons, one of which is nostalgia. I first saw this movie in, it was either 93 or 94. It was after it had come out on VHS rental. And there was an, I don't know exactly what happened. Like maybe my folks had rented it or something, but me and a friend decided she would have like a, you know, Friday night sleepover or something. I was like 12 or 13 at the time. And we decided to watch this movie. Why not? And we ended up watching it twice in one night. Wow. We watched it. We rewound it. We watched it again. And we were just transfixed by this film. And at 12 or 13 years old, I didn't pick up all of the subtle plot points. And even now watching it, like you blink and you miss something. I really actually recommend if you've never seen this movie before, watch it. Then read the Wikipedia article on what the fuck is going on, and then rewatch it again. Anyway, uh, but this this movie <laughs> yeah, this yeah. movie not only has my like favorite actor of all time in it, Wes Studi, but it, this movie just has everything. 
It is a beaut- is beautifully shot. It has the best movie soundtrack of all time. It's, I will plus one that statement. It definitely. Is, yeah, it is well written. It is well acted. It is well edited. It's it's one of I think the best movies out there. I'm sorry. I think Daniel Day Lewis did not do a great job. I'm so sorry. Well, I love this movie, but sure. I don't think he did a great job. It's it's a hard the 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 stereotypical fucking white savior role is I think always going to be complicated and fraught yeah. with weirdness. I mean, I think he did fantastically because I just I well, I love Daniel Day Lewis, but it's the other it's it's really some of the other actors that really are what make this film amazing. He he did vocally is is where I think he he fell flat a couple of times. Hmm, interesting. More on that later, perhaps. There's a reason why he kind of fell like fell flat is Daniel Day Lewis came off of My Left Foot. That was the movie he did like prior to this. And he wasn't a big Hollywood star yet. This yeah. is his first no, major. This was, this was the one that made him. Yeah, yeah. this, yeah. Him this was map. his first major blockbuster. And then he he's also a consummate method actor. So yeah, it kind of bugged a lot of the yeah. crew because he did go out and stay in the forest for like three months at a time <laughs> prior to <laughs> filming. And like he did lived running the through the forest. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. He, he, he worked with like special uh, a special operative for the military to, to, to learn how to fight and with the guns. And it kind of weirded people out. And I, and I think I think I would have I'll have to agree with you a little bit. He is a little stiff. Yeah, he's not. It was not his finest work. No. That being said, I totally agree. This was my favorite movie until I saw Master and Commander, oh. and that became my favorite. Okay, movie. Right. Same, same period. Yeah. Yeah. Those scenes of him running through the forest and whatnot, every single time you could almost hear Ted Nugent playing in the background. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> no. What? <laughs> no, because Nuge was like that whole Nuge was like a, a rock star, hardcore survivalist person. So you could basically like see him running through and you're like, yeah, rock and roll. No, no, no. Nuge <laughs> runs through on a fucking ATV. This was a man in buckskin running through. <laughs> yes. I could, I could, I could see why you, why you might think that he, that he, that he's a little Ew, you brought or up whatever, Ted Nugent but... in one of my favorite movies. I feel gross. I know. We got to go shower now, folks. We'll be right back. How dare str- you? He got a use... stranglehold on you guys. <laughs> yeah, oh, 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 hey, you know the best part of Dune? I think Al Bundy would really have done Dune really well. <laughs> you know oh, what? He's actually a really good actor, and he probably could do Dune very yeah. well. Actually, you know what? If you picture Al I hear Bundy, he's going to be Duncan Idaho. <laughs> Dude, you know what? No, put him as Gurney Halleck or as Duke Leto. Any yeah. way. Anyway, I right, think... So this... Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> we always come back to Dune, don't uh, we? Yeah, we do. Always comes back Dune, to Dune or Sneakers. Oh, sneakers. Cosmo did nothing wrong. Could you imagine this? I want, that could, should be our first t-shirt. Could you yes. Im- oh, my God. We'll I would cons. wear that. We will wear it at the cons. I would wear that. I think the shirt I want now is former Method Actors Anonymous or something like that. Anyway. With Dana Day-Lewis's with face Daniel on it. Day-Lewis. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I think, I mean, I personally think he did He did fantastic. I could see where you might be like, eh, know like blah, 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 blah. but like i i think he did a wonderful job it, and he's in he, he is notoriously a, a method actor and did like i don't know how much data mine we're gonna go into in a minute here but he he really only does like one film every six years or so he's very selective about what about what he does and honestly i think it's because his wife would probably leave him if he did more than that probably because he's just I mean, God bless him, but to be a, that hardcore of a method actor, you are nutty. This is one of those hardcore, um, just atmospheric pieces. This is so melancholy and so sad and so tragic. And the book isn't. I don't know. Has anyone else here read it? I tried I to read it and I, I just couldn't. I'm the same. I That's tried to the, read it yeah. when I was the, about the, 14. The and, book yeah. is yeah. pulp incomprehensible <laughs> or something. I, I remember um, the book being Mugwort pretty... tries to marry the girl. She doesn't jump off the cliff. I mean, all the, the great heart tugging scenes of mm-hmm. the movie aren't in the book. This is just one where they really did it right. So Do... they made the book better. Oh, so oh, much better. Yeah. From what I read. And they yeah. got rid of yeah. Natty Bumpo. Yeah. He's Nathaniel, just like you. Uh, in the yeah, movie. It, his name is initially, it was, it was, yes, Haw- it was Hawkeye. Has, yeah. He has so many, Awful names. Hawkeye, and that was changed what to are the other Natty Bumpapoe. 
and just then Bumpo. Nathaniel Poe in the movie. Mm-hmm. They do call him Hawkeye at one point. Nathaniel, there's another, there's another one. There's two rifles yeah. and leather stocking and two hands. Long rifle. Yeah. Long, Long rifle. rifle. Long yeah. rifle. Yeah. Speaking yeah. of that, that rifle that he carried was damn gorgeous. Wait, it's not a rifle. It's a flint flintlock. Yeah. Because a... rifling didn't exist back then, right? Right? What? No. I right? think it was a musket. No, it's a flintlock. Oh, it's a flint. flint lock? I think okay. it's a flintlock uh, firearm. I don't think rifling was commonplace, uh, which is part of why the barrels were so long. Forty, wasn't it? Right. I think seventeen fifty. I think rifling had uh, been invented, but had not been was not widely yeah, used. No. Part of the long barrel on the guns was was in, increased. And with that, we'll take you right into anyway, sharps sorry, yeah. rifles. <laughs> Someone will correct us. I'm trying to remember. I looked this up a real long time ago. Um, the guy actually from Sharps is in here. Uh, the the evil sergeant. Evil sergeant. Who is he in this? Uh, he is one of Monroe's aides. And I wrote this thing. Is he in every period piece from this time period? Pete Postlethwaite was yeah. it? Yeah. Oh, the guy with like the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a very distinct looking dude. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, it he looks like he's never had. Ha- oh, really? Great. Yeah. yeah. He uh, yeah. 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 a few years back. He was also in. Uh, he was. What's his name in uh, Usual Suspects? Well, he was in uh, yeah. Romeo and Juliet. Mm-hmm. The, yep. the oh god, fucking... he was he was the friar. Yeah, yeah. He mm-hmm. is that guy who appears in everything you've ever seen. Yeah, he was also in <laughs> yeah. the town with Ben Affleck. Yeah. He was like the, he was the mob yeah. boss. So for this movie, nine hundred Native Americans from all of the United States were actually employed uh, to shoot, most notably for the Cherokee tribes, even though they came from a number of different tribes. But Michael Mann wanted to keep it as authentic as possible, so rather than go out and get you know white guys and kind of use makeup he was like nope we're gonna go ahead and and get actual native americans yeah which was nice i think they were cherokee no they were playing well no they were from the cherokee tribe they were from the cherokee nation playing the 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 hurons and the the mohawks and the gotcha okay yeah man i had a lot of sympathy for uh like Magua? Magua. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, poor yeah. Magua. Like, he's, he's, he's not making it into evil uh, when we get to that part of the show. I just want to <laughs> let you know. You don't want to face me down on this because I've got notes. Dude. <laughs> he is a very troubled and traumatized man. Yeah. yeah. I Oh, my God. Wes Duty. Can I just for a minute talk about how much yes, I love yeah. Wes Duty? He Duty's. is amazing. He yeah. is my, I think, hands down my favorite actor. He is. Wait, you're gonna have to pick now. Tend to do this, or I, you know, and I try to, I try to think of to, to about anybody who. So compares. if the two of them were fighting on a cliff, which would you? God. They're sort of like Vigo Mortensen and Wes Studi, and they're so different. I feel like I can't even like put them in the same. I don't know. They're, they're, he never gets cast as the nice guy either. Well, when he was in Mystery Men, he was kind of nice. He West Duty? Yeah, he was the Sphinx in Mystery Men. He's oh, really? really? It's really silly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. He was also in a uh, short-lived television show with Adam Beach, another amazing First Nation actor. Let, let's save the actor deep dive for oh, later in the West, show. West Duty, yeah, I love yeah. you. Just, he's very, okay, I'm going to talk more about West Duty later because <laughs> he's very active on his Facebook page and he engages with his fans a lot and he's awesome. Nice. Okay. West Duty, if you're looking to sponsor a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so this movie was directed by Michael Mann, uh-huh. uh, and if some of the if, if no one really knows who Michael Mann is, here's a few uh, a few of the movies that he has done in the in the past. Manhunter, which is the one where he became really famous Man for Manhunter. Yes, Manhunter, mm-hmm. as in the first Hannibal Lecter movie. Yes, yeah. Uh, he did Heat with uh, De Niro and Pacino, Val Kilmer, the the robbery movie, one of my favorite movies ever made. You like those. Yeah, actually, I really do like bank robbery movies yeah. a lot because I, I, I make comment about them all the time. So, yes, he also did Ali with Will Smith. Uh, then he did The Aviator with oh. Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> the Kingdom with Orlando Bloom. Uh, no, no, that's Kingdom. No, that's Kingdom of Heaven. Yeah, Kingdom sorry. Of- King- we should do that movie. I'm down to do that movie. Which one? Kingdom, Kingdom of Heaven? Kingdom of Heaven. Heaven. You've oh seen that, right? God. No. Wait, it's what, a maybe? crusade movie. Yeah, the crusade. No, movie. I haven't seen that. Oh, it's one. really oh, good. It is good. And then Public Enemies with Johnny Depp. Yeah. So those are a few of the movies that he has done. Can and I say really briefly how glad I am that Johnny Depp dropped off the spectrum? He is hurting the 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 new Harry Potter movies, the 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 Crimes of Grindelwald. 
he they did it did not do as well as they had hoped because of Johnny Depp was in it. Yeah, because Johnny Depp is not Jeff Goldblum, and only Jeff Goldblum can play the same character in every film and get away with it. This is one of those movies I could, like we said earlier, I could not make it through the book. I, any of the books. I, I will normally rake you over the coals for that. Normally. I know. But this time you're entirely correct. This this is one of those where where if someone says, oh, I've never read this, I will say, go watch the movie just like I will with Lord of the Rings. Go watch the movie. Don't read the books. Go Word. watch the movies. Will you say that for Lord of the What? Yeah, uh, I don't yeah, like same. Lord of the Rings. I'm sorry. Kill, fucking come at I, me. I agree. I got halfway through. I'm not going to come at you. I'm just going <laughs> to glare at you the for the two, rest of your I got life. halfway through the two towers I, where I had to I, stop. I was like, not fucking. Who are you, people? I respe- you know what? I respect Tolkien. I, I actually, I like The Hobbit. I like The Similarian. Yeah, I the love kid's those. book. I'm glad you made your way through that. <laughs> the <laughs> fucking <laughs> child's book. No, and I like The Similarian, all the mythos. The Wait, wait. Brilliant. So you read you read the kids' book and you read the fucking Bible. Yes, but you can't read the actual story. No, it's too uh. fucking dry. That was a long discussion that we had, and it's just going to be cut out. But um, so the screenwriters uh, James Fenimore Cooper was the actual author of the book, uh, but Michael Mann and Christopher Crowe were the screenwriters for this movie that we watch. Now Christopher Crowe. He also worked on mostly just TV shows. Uh, he worked on Airwolf, <laughs> BJ and the Bear. Wait, what? What was the name of that? BJ and the Bear. That it sounds was, like a radio show. No, it was no, a TV show. It doesn't in like sound the like a radio show. Seventies, early eighties. It was like I think it was a, a a highway patrolman, like the Bear, like Smokey, you know, the, the, a cop the band. Yeah, the I think it was yeah, yeah. trying to capture that a little bit. A uh, movie he did with Mark Wahlberg uh, called Fear. And then he also did a small bit, a story in the movie, the anthology movie Nightmares, if you guys remember that when we were kids. Oh, it's no. great. He did The Bishop of Battle, which was the video game one with Emilio Estevez, if I remember correctly. So those, that's what he had worked on. One of the things I really like um, about this movie is just it's 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 melancholic. Um Nobody gets out scot free. Everyone is beaten. Everyone is tired. Everyone is is pushed to their last extreme. Mm-hmm. And it's really good about showing how people react under stress. Like uh, Alice, for example, has you can see it in her eyes as the escape happens, and then they they find uh, safety in the stockade, um, and then they have to escape again. And you can just see the PTSD building and building in it, and you can see it in her eyes. She has the most expressive eyes in this movie. And when she finally has her step off the cliff moment, it's just, it's, it's just this heartbreaking moment. Yeah. Um, her character was fairly tragic in that regard. Yeah. Everyone. Most of her, uh, her sequences were actually cut out of the movie. Uh, the, the, the secondary romance between her and, uh, I, I'm not going to pronounce his names right. Uh, Uncas, I think that's how Uncas. 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 Uh, it didn't even make it into the movie. It was rumored that there was this more, this very more explicit love scene between them, uh, but it was cut at the insistence of her mother because the actress was like 16 years old at the time oh. of the movie. Her mother was there on set every day to chaperone her because she didn't want to have an accidental real lovemaking scene happen. Fair enough. Yeah. So uh now that's pretty good for a for a movie mom. Yeah, fair enough. That yeah. Yeah. Hollywood is brought with pedophiles, so hey. <laughs> yeah. But man also didn't want the that romance between the two to distract from the main love story between Hawkeye and I like the hint of that too. And I also like how how much Uncas took that. Like there, there there wasn't there was no kiss, there was no you know, holding each other in our arms and watching the sun come up. But he still went to rescue her, mm-hmm. which is a very mm-hmm. pure moment. I mean, he he literally gave his life to get to her. And he was the last um in the in the the you'll you'll learn this in the book or whatever, if you ever bother with it. Um he was the last of the Mohicans. Mm-hmm. He was the the true son of the father by uh, him and a Mohican woman. So that with with him and with that act, died the last of the Mohicans. Mm-hmm. And I don't. I don't think a lot of people like realize that. Yeah. Yeah. One of the scenes they the very end scene of the monologue that uh, Chingachgook gives 
was the regular theatrical release was was unfortunately cut a little bit, but in the extended release, he explains a little bit more about you know what's what's to come and how he's the last of his kind, and it's it's pretty heartbreaking. Which extended version did you did you guys watch? Oh gosh, I got there, there's the... a theatrical like mm-hmm. directors. Well, if it was the Plex, not one. the like no, because there's 117, a... 114, and then like 109 minutes. I have the DVD, the extended cut DVD. So that so, was probably the 114. Yeah, I don't think it's the okay. like ultimate director's cut or whatever. Whatever this was came the out. definitive edition, the yeah. one that we watched. Which I think was the one I had. I didn't recognize anything new in it. Yeah, nothing seemed new to me. Yeah, there there wasn't a lot like that was added. I mean, initially the movie Michael Mann had this movie. It was three hours long, and the studio was like, "No, cut it. You cannot do this. Mm-hmm. You're already over budget. Cut it." So a lot of stuff got cut. I'm glad they did because a lot of that probably would have been talking, and I I think I think the desperation as events lead to event lead to event, mm-hmm. uh, just you know, unstoppable and building and building and building and building and building and building. Was what made it made it more compelling. It's really good pacing. Man is also Michael Mann is also similar to Kubrick in the sense of we're going to do this again. We're going to do it again. We're going to yeah. do it again. We're going to do it again. And there are accounts uh, that I mind on that there would be like thirty takes of a scene. I mean, Kubrick you should do thirty takes of a scene, not one hundred and fifty takes. But you know, uh, you think with the cost of movies, it's, it's get it right. You know, well, then it was still it was still film. So that gets really fucking expensive. Yeah. And yeah, it does. It, I mean, with digital, it can be like, just let it go. I mean, they don't even have to wait for the dailies. It's right there. Yeah. Well, And they were hauling all of their film and equipment like out in, you know, goddamn nowhere, North Carolina. Like they were <laughs> like up mountainsides yeah. and yeah. trails yeah. and national parks. And that was expensive. Well, it really showed the Appalachians off to a. Oh, it's good. So yeah, so because it was, supposed to be t- it was supposed to be in New York. Yeah. It's supposed to be upstate. Yeah. Albany, upstate. Yeah, but it was it was filmed mostly in North and South Dakota, as as, as you stated. No, Carolina. C- Carolina. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, some of the footage actually was taken from the Biltmore Estate in Asheville, mm-hmm. uh, because there are trees that are planted over a hundred years ago. And it's the closest to the sa- similar forestry today that had during that exact same time frame. Neat. But back to Michael Mann. The the studio was so upset that it was taking so long, they actually had to send somebody out to literally stand behind him, like two feet away, and go, okay, dude, wrap it up. Go to the next <laughs> scene. You're taking too long. I hate people like that. Mm. Wrap it up, B. So the one big, that it, early on when, when they're uh, walking upriver, and he's talking about, you know, how, why, is, why was the girl, you know, picked to be murdered, that wasn't shot until nine days before they previewed it to a select group of people. Holy shit. That's wow. how, like, he was doing yeah. everything to the very last second, That's apparently. That's excessive. Yeah. Wow. I don't know if it is, because it made this movie. This that, movie, that that, you know, to be fair, <laughs> and, you know, I think, I think this, I was speaking of which, some same, some same shit went down with, like, Lord of the Rings, where it was like they were delivering the final print, yeah. like, a day before opening night mm-hmm. or whatever. But you know what? It, the movie is, it's a work of art. It's beautiful. Yeah, like when Cora's clinging to him after the battle and she just goes, the, the whole world's on fire. That line always gets me. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Just the the way she delivered that, that wasn't a first take. That wasn't a 20th take. That was 50 takes. And they're like, I liked number 17. I yeah. think it really showed it the best. <laughs> like, uh, or when Alice, when she sees that Alice has jumped off the cliff and she gives that heart wrenching oh, cry. Oh, God. I mean, I tear up on that one every time. That's without, Michael Mann. without fail, I can yeah. still cry. That's Michael Mann getting in there. I need all the emotion, every bad thing that you could ever think of that happened in your life. I need you to scream. Yeah. That's your sister's it. broken body down there. Well, and just that <laughs> that moment where Magua sees what he what um she's gonna do, and he's like trying to beckon her back, and like that moment of like actual concern for her. It's I don't know that it's concern for her. I think it's the concern. For his plans for her. It's it's not, mm. it's like something I want, it's it's a possession mm-hmm. doing something, it's now at risk. Yeah, it's a really, it's a really complex moment because we're not entirely, like, sure of his he motives. Was, he was paying attention to the attack he just went through mm-hmm. uh, by Uncas, and in the aftermath of that, while he's still breathing and panting, 
Mm-hmm. She just moves to the cliff. Yeah, she just like takes covered a few in this steps. blood. Like, yeah. with, like you see when he lifts his hand up, like his yeah. blood is all. Uh, oh my god! Yeah, that moment is so heartbreaking. And he just kind of like, huh, and then goes about, goes about walking. You know when uh, uh, Magua. Oh, did he look badass in that war paint? That was kind of oh, like a mantle. Yeah, was yeah, awesome. Yeah. Um, when totally. when uh, when he ambushes the surrendered troops, that is a historical fact. By the way, that mm-hmm. happened. It didn't happen at the time. It didn't happen at the place, but it was nearby and in the same war. That was that was a, th- a thing that happened. That the the French had promised um, their their local allies vengeance. Yeah, and then. They were still following the chivalric tradition of that particular war, and they had surrendered with honor, and he was ready to leave him go. Um, you know how he says uh, in the movie, I do not wish to be fighting these men again. Yes. Um, historically, they're pretty sure that never happened. In the movie, it's a, it's a good vehicle for to, to make matters you know keep going, but uh, the French general... It historically did not say that as far as we know they're fairly yeah, no. positive about they it didn't have a camera <laughs> recording no <laughs> but i mean there's always aid standing by and notes taken yeah. and yeah yeah because yeah, wasn't it standard practice that whenever a when, general yeah. or someone was talking there was someone that was scribbling everything down yeah 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 but that was like a secret covert meeting like he it was off that was off the record that whole like Hey man, do do whatever you got to do. Go do it. Like I'm not going to give you an order, but I'm going to look the other way. One thing I did love is the comp- that those, those ambushes. The two ambushes, the first one and the second one. The so the first one, he just walks back, whips out the axe, whack, whacks, whacks <laughs> that dude, yeah. and everyone's like, "What? That's what? not how war is conducted." What? They didn't really expect that to happen. Yeah. So no. they're all like lining up. He keeps chopping the, too yeah, yeah. before anyone yeah. responds. And the guy like smiles at him, yeah. like right before he gets the axe. And then to the his second throat. one, the second, the actual ambush of the of the retreating of the you know the surrender, the mm-hmm. ambush of the surrendered troops. One dude just runs out of the woods and chops some dude. Yeah. They're like, what? Mm-hmm. And then some other dude just runs out of the woods and chops someone else. And the whole line is like. Oh, well, that's unusual. <laughs> then, then finally, the attack happened. They all start yelling from the bushes yeah. just to fuck with them. Well, too. you know the uh, the 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 concept of the clockwork soldier came from this time because that's what they had literally beaten and killed into these men was that you don't do anything without orders, mm-hmm. and they will kill you if you do. So hmm. yeah, smile, hi, whack. Oh, look, he's killing my buddy. That looks like that sucks. Whack. Yeah. Guess I'll wait for my uh, general to, to do something about yeah. that. And when they do, when they do finally move to act, they all get in like three you know, short ranks, get ready to all fire in one little area. I'm like, wow. Yeah. That's yeah. how that was. Yeah. It's just fascinating. And and, and that yeah. that's so kind of how, oh, don't worry about it. That's when, when, the, the, when we went to war with the British, you know, when, when, when you know, when we were getting our independence, that was one thing f- from everything that I've read that like fucked up the British was because we wouldn't do those three road attacks. We would just do these like the the was where the Minutemen came from. They would just ambush the British, just shoot at them, and then fucking run off. Yeah, volley tactics are great mm-hmm. if someone is willing to stand there yeah, and take yeah, it. Yeah. I, I never, I have never understood that 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 part of British history because the British fought the French. And just standing that, that's where in the line, British fight. The British fight the French. The French fight the British. Standing in line, holding a rifle and firing it, and then reloading, and the, the group behind you firing, and no one's moving, no one's taking cover, and you have a big red jacket on with a big white cross. And that, that would be why stupid. we won the Revolutionary War <laughs> yeah, about 30, 40 years later. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, we couldn't have done ball it without traveling the, at 200 without yards Napoleon. a second. Yeah. Uh, there, there's a lot of things. It wasn't yeah. the jackets. No, I, I know. I, I know. Those fucking red coats. They can't see us. I'll tell you, it, it's actually interesting because uh, Britain and France fight each other. It's, it's literally what they've done since the beginning of time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and they've developed this, this code of warfare that is not shared anywhere else between any two traditional adversaries in the whole planet. The, that concept of, of chivalrous combat is, is not a common thing. 
it exists in that area and that area alone simply because they're like, all right, well, we're going to kill off three quarters of the young male population. Let's do this once a generation. Okay, well, we have to figure out how to make this <laughs> shit work, okay? Because we still need to have a country. So yeah. they developed this this intricate system of war, and it's just fascinating. I think it was after, up, up to World War One. I, I think, there was still the the the, the policy of uh, quartering. I think um, soldiers. If, if you if you captured a soldier, not quartering like horse quartering, but if you captured a soldier, you 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 like housed them. Oh, the 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 exchange. The uh, yeah, if you surrendered, you were sent to a, a fairly nice jail. Yeah, that changed you with got Napoleon. Your meals and you yeah, did. you got your meals, and eventually you were exchanged for an officer of you know rank as long as you promised not to come back and fight the same guy. <laughs> yeah. And then after once World War II hit, it was like, no, shoot you, stab you, fuck you, yeah, ga- mustard yeah. gas. Well, like, like the, yeah. the whole scene of the war changed. Yeah. Like the whole way that war was fought. We have heavy artillery now. Fuck all of you. Well, Speaking at that point, which, we were allies. The, you know. the, the heavy artillery in this, I don't think was cannons like they described. It's like when those 38 cannon get here, those aren't cannons that they pushed up. Were they fire pots? Those are cannonades. Cannonade. Yeah, then they were, yeah, what you got? No, I was going to give you a little bit of technical part, but please go ahead. Okay, yeah, I, they they were actually, like, made obsolete years and years before that, and I'm not sure if that was a glaring technical error or if I'm just, like, identifying it wrong, but those big round fucking... Yeah, they're the big cannons. Yeah, I, thought I, th- I think there. those are cannonades. They might have been mortars, but either way, they didn't have to dig them that close. I because a, a big 38-inch cannon Mm -hmm. which is what they said they had isn't that big round thing good point the technical part of it because they didn't actually during the movie they actually obviously did not use cannon balls when they were firing anything off this movie sucks i thought they were method (laughs) actors god one person was a method no so they they he's really he's the only person running around in the background he's like snuck a cannon (laughs) and do it and starts blowing stuff up and everyone's like god damn it daniel stop that shit so that you know, when they get to the when they get to the fort with the with the two women and and they go up in and you see everybody's got the cannons and they're they're getting them set up and they're firing, what they're actually firing out are spray painted black basketballs. Sweet. And they actually did use. I still would not want to take one of they those. They still. No, I know the, the funny thing is they still yeah, use they still use gunpowder to get the action. And they fired mm-hmm. them out. But because the bat, they would either explode inside and you get nothing but just the remnants, or they would go out on fire about twenty feet and then just drop to the ground and then just roll, and that was it, and melt. And everybody who's ever played dodgeball ever was just like having PTSD triggers. Probably. He says a term that I hear a lot because I watch a lot of uh, movies and fiction from this era, and that's uh, subordinate to the interests of the crown when the, the farmers are trying to mm-hmm. to go back to their homes, and that was something that was. I was really drilled into the British of of that era and uh, applied to their possession at the time here in America. And I just, I I think it's, I'm really glad to see that's gone. That uh, the the British loyalists, that uh, the modern England is so different. There's like this lingering reverence to the queen. That's almost like a racial memory. And that's it. Like that, that whole vast militaristic machine is just, it's just gone. And yeah, that, it was that whole done after World thought. War II. Yeah, which is odd because they all came together in common cause again then. But I mean, it's a very interesting thing, and I, I keep seeing that uh, that particular phrase subordinate to the interests of the crown. That makes me want to research the concept further. Like, is that an actual order, military order? We have gone on for almost forty minutes now. More actually, with some of the stuff that we've cut, we haven't talked about the music. Oh. I was going to get to that. Let's do it. Okay. All right. So the the I'm main down. the main theme of the mu- of the movie was taken from the Gale, which you I know you really like, uh, which is by Scottish singer songwriter Dougie McLean, uh, which was on his 1990 album The Search. Uh, do you have this album, Matthew? Okay. All right. That was a yes from Matthew. Yeah. I I I, I know. I also <laughs> have uh, like all the Clannad albums, which was the other big hit. Clannad. Excellent. Uh, also renowned Scottish fiddler uh, Alasdair Fraser is the fiddler on the soundtrack. But he is not credited at all, which is oh, unfortunate. Which is yeah. shitty. He did an so amazing wh- why job. Why don't you say his name again then? His name is Alasdair Fraser. Nice job. Thank you. I appreciate that. We give you credit here on Have Movies. <laughs> <laughs> Woo-hoo! So Randy Edelman, though, did did most of the music also. They did most of the score. Actually, there were two. 
uh, Randy Edelman and Trevor Jones. Trevor Jones. Now, according to Randy Edelman, in a 1996 Film Score Monthly interview that he did, he came on board because of creative differences between Trevor Jones and Michael Mann. So Trevor Jones had left, uh, and that forced Jones off of the project. The movie was over budget, as it was quoted, and there was a mess with the studio. The only reason that Morgan Creek got the rights to not just the music and the album, but the overseas rights is because the whole situation apparently from, from what the interview was talking about was just way out of control. It was way out beyond anything that they thought. And everybody was fighting. It was just a huge fiasco. Uh, Daniel day Lewis was the bigger um, box office star at the time, having, having won an Oscar a couple of years earlier for, uh, for, for my left foot. So there are two credited composers on this, Randy Edelman and Trevor Jones. Now, I like both of these composers a lot. They've done a lot of movie scores that I personally really like. If you are not, if you don't know Randy Edelman, you may have known some of his music. He did music for The Mummy, Tomb of the Dragon King, Gods and Generals, Shanghai Knights, Triple X, The Skulls, and Dragon Heart. Not some of me on this guy here, Dusty. It's, <laughs> Randy, it's good music. Randy it, Edelman? Yeah, yeah. Randy Didn't Edelman. Didn't he also do Dragon the Bruce Lee story? Yes. Yes. He has a very extensive resume. I'm going with things that more people might have actually. That's okay. This is actually a running <sighs> gag with him. Yeah, <laughs> it's like I'm trying to go with things they they want. Yes, you know, uh, Trevor... like a sandwich at midnight. You all saw that movie, right? And we're like, what? Trevor <laughs> Jones worked on Notting Hill, Dark City. Okay. All right. All right. Ooh ooh ooh! I know the other one. Okay. Labyrinth. Yes. Uh, also, The Dark Crystal, Excalibur, Arachnophobia, Cliffhanger, and G.I. Jane. But there was clearly a superior... Um, <laughs> oh, Trevor Jones hair. is a much... <laughs> yeah. His resume is a lot more involved. Let's say that. Yeah. Okay. But creative differences <laughs> usually means that someone was a bit of a diva. Well, all I know is that Trevor Jones was the one responsible for the gale and responsible for that tune. And that tune is yeah. fucking amazing. Yep. Well, he's responsible for its incorporation. And give credit. Now, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Well, the main theme, uh, the Gale, is by Dougie McLean, and he that's out off of his album. Yeah. But the Fiddler did not get credit, which yeah, is kind but, of odd. I mean, which is crap. Yeah. Uh, I also like the Clannad song. They did. They've done a lot of music um, that's been in movies. Uh, Harry's Game. I don't know if anyone's ever saw that. Mm-hmm. Um, they also did the uh, the BBC Robin Hood before the current hipster Robin Hood. Okay, we're running long here, guys. What else we got? That's what I got, except for the the line uh, at the waterfall. Just stay alive, however you can. I will find you. Yeah. I will find you. I say that to Jessica most mornings before she goes to work. <laughs> <laughs> and like I said, like was said earlier, you know, she's a little bit younger than me, and uh, <laughs> she has no idea what I'm talking about. Every time I say that. You submit. You hear me? You stay alive. Yeah. I use that other line. If they in don't different kill areas. you, they'll take you up north of the Huron land. You stay alive no matter what oh my occurs. God. I will find you. <laughs> what? No matter how Nothing. long it takes, no matter how far, I will find you. What, Dusty? Did you think I was a power bottom? <laughs> no, <laughs> oh, I think you're a a loving. I just want to make switch. direct eye contact. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah final words, Dusty. <laughs> What? Final words. I think that was the game. Um, <laughs> how ma- I don't normally we do like how many lightsabers would you give this or how many pistols? Tomahawks. Would, tom- we would go tomahawks. Right. How many long tom- guns? Long guns. What how many that, red coats? What was that fucking bone hatchet thing that I have that no idea. cook you, used? Uh, that was it, that fucking like femur bone of a moose. I, that was, there was one close up of it when they're pulling it out of the river, and I think it was made of metal. Really? And I have no idea what the fuck that, that was. Awesome. I, I want know. one. It's badass weapon number yeah. six is what that is. How exactly. many badass weapons number six would you give this? I would, out of ten? Out of ten. Out of ten. I, w- I would give this a very, very solid eight and a half. This is a ten for me. This is this is a complete movie. It's it's a ten. This movie this movie is 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 fantastic start to finish. Every aspect of this movie is on point and it is a work of art. I'm gonna go with Dusty. Eight and a half to a nine. Thank you. I don't think it was perfect. It was good. It was really good, but it had its issues. This is a you know. perfect movie. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like the Lord of the Rings. Is the well, I, was, I was not <laughs> going to say it. <laughs> I was biting my... 
Hi, this is Matthew. Thanks for listening. We wanted to take a moment to talk to you about uh, one of our sponsors, Guardian Games. Guardian Games has been with us since the very beginning of this show. Guardian Games is Portland's premier game store. They have magic miniatures, shelves and shelves and shelves and shelves of RPGs, all the gaming swag, anything you could possibly want for your gaming experience. If you're ever in Portland and looking for a gaming store, Guardian Games is the biggest, most diverse store in Portland. You definitely owe it to yourself to go to Guardian Games. Well, Dusty, tell us about the characters in this movie. So we have Daniel Day-Lewis as Hawkeye slash Nathaniel Poe. Natty Bumpo. And that as well. So oddly enough, when the movie was first announced, John Cusack was mentioned for an unspecified part. What? That was rumored to be that he was going to take too fat this in the role. face. Yeah. Well, John? I don't know about 1992. I mean, still too fat in the face. Really? He's John always been a little chubby cheek. Yeah. yeah, he's mm-hmm. like he he put um, Tom Cruise to shame with his running scenes. I don't think John Cusack could do that. Mm. I just don't. He's a taller man. He can run faster than Tom Cruise. <laughs> <laughs> All right, alignment. Oh, for him, yes. chaotic good, chaotic good. Mm-hmm. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> And then we have Madeline Stowe as Cora Monroe, who actually was not going to star in the movie. It was only after she realized it had a love story that was underneath the main plot that she agreed to audition for the movie. So she like wanted a love story? She like that wanted was what maybe she story. wanted Daniel Day Lewis. Yeah. She you wanted You want to make out with Daniel Day Lewis? Because I want to make uh, out with Daniel Day Lewis. Apparently, he will hold you into the sunset. Yes. Even Sunrise. though they were basically undressing each other, yeah. you know, with their eyes throughout the whole movie. When the camera wasn't rolling, they were huge pranksters and they would continuously try to one up each other on set. <laughs> That's amazing. Getting everybody involved where everyone had to like look behind their shoulders to see if there was something hidden someplace. But yes, so Madeline Stowe, alignment. Uh, lawful good. I always lean to you on first on this. Yeah, lawful good. Lawful good. Down. <sighs> what about you, Dusty? You didn't answer this one or the last one. No, yeah, I did. I said I agreed. Oh. Okay. With with Cora Monroe, I so, given the time period, she's a little chaotic and good for her gender at the time. Given her, you know, she just, I, I love this character because she just steps the fuck up. She gets a gun. She just rolls with it. She had pockets in her skirt. She bucks against her dad. She bucks against her dad. So That's a she, no-no. Yeah, so for Ultimately for obeyed the, him, though. No. Didn't try and break him out. <laughs> didn't true true you can say what you want is there is there something that's like somewhere between i was talking in between like she's 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 that would be neutral good yeah Yeah. but she's still a little chaotic given given the time period i I didn't see that at all especially Mm. in a frontier environment I, i thought she reflected her environment well yeah but she's like a proper british lady and she just likes i don't know like the other we don't see the other women around there carrying guns and shooting I think the deal is that and... she doesn't ever take action, any kind of non lawful action. She may mm. take she may like voice her opinion and mm-hmm. she may stand up, but a lot of it is based on action. Mm. At least the alignment system. You mm-hmm. know, how your your alignment portrays your action and, and how you are how you guide your methods of play and she may have sassed back, but she didn't take any, she didn't do anything overtly chaotic herself. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the fact that she turned down Duncan's marriage proposal is kind of a big fucking deal, given the time. Your he dad was, was a general and she could tell him to fuck off. Yeah, he was yeah. literally beneath her station. Yeah, eh, he was. Fair enough. Fair yep. enough. Then we have Russell Means as Chinga Chikuk. Chinga Chikuk. Thank you. I would put him as a neutral good. I was just mm. going to go lawful good. Yeah, most I people think, are lawful good. I, I, I think lawful most good. of us, I think pretty much everyone other than the obvious was just lawful good. The, Why uh, would you say neutral good? He just seemed to be generally good. Not Actions. too chaotic, but also not too lawful. Actions. Yeah, I know, but I, I get the feeling that he was just sort of there. You know, he he wasn't. Even though he is the titular character, he says so at the end. I am now the last of the Mohicans. He was just kind of there. I don't mm. see how that makes him. I mean, 
it, it Bob, was hard. the accountant, it also he, goes he through life along. also. I mean, there. if we if we're gonna say that Daniel Day Lewis was chaotic good, because well, Russell he, means he went encouraged along with... men to desert their posts. That that's why. Well, that's he the also only lived, reason. He also lived outside of the law. Like he lived outside of the British law to the point that they're like, you you're gonna you're gonna fight first? No, because society again, to, yeah. English law. That's not his law. Well, he's a white man. He's he's British. He's the adopted son. He's a white man. He's British. As far as the crown believes. So that's a that's an interesting concept. Uh, I, I feel that it's really, I don't know. You always have to look at it through his society, and yeah. he left English society at age three. So the deal is, we don't know anything about Chingachgook. Was that his name? Chingachgook. Chingachgook society. Or Chingachgook. Chingachgook. I think it's Chingachgook. I think the second syllable was pronounced in that one. I, I could be wrong, but. He was, we don't really know anything about their society at all. Like, you know, we're, we as the white watchers of this movie know him as the Indian. Who's, so he kind of falls into that role. I guess I'll default of to awful good. The I just, wise, I, yeah. the older I just get wise more of a man. Neutral good vibe from him. You know, I can't really piece why. And have- Russell Means is, he's a Native American activist, he's the First Nations, the. Uh, all about the separation of the First Nation lands yeah. and uh, the foundation. The he's been heavy yeah. in in tribal politics yeah. since like the the, the mid- yeah. early seventies. Oh, absolutely, yeah. very yeah. heavy into it. Unfortunately, yes. he passed away in two thousand twelve. Oh, really? Russell Means is no longer with us. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. Mm. Oh well. There's some peace, dude. He was he's an amazing human. He was yeah. an amazing human being. Then we have Eric Schweig as Uncas. 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 Uh, also, lawful good. Yeah, I will go lawful or neutral, neutral, lawful good or neutral good. I'd say neutral. Yeah, Probably you, you neutral. said to me something that stuck to me once, and that is most people that you will ever meet are lawful good. Yeah, and if if I don't see an overt action, I'm I'm actually going with that from that um, unless he, you act in a chaotic manner, which I never saw him do, or in a, a neutral so manner. How would you define neutral good? Neutral good. Yeah, it's one that we never use. We've used it um, once in the entire span of this podcast. See, it's a tough one. Okay, so if Robin Hood is chaotic good, uh-huh. and and then I would say neutral good is someone to the effect of, and I, I this is going to come out that absolutely, would do right. absolutely wrong. No, neutral good is someone more like uh, Jesus, the the titular Jesus. Jesus is the epitome of neutral good. Yeah. yeah. Good so for the sake so of good. someone who who would buck the law to such a degree as to utterly attempt to overthrow it, but isn't uh, does doesn't do it for any horrible reason, or even okay. or even a selfish reason. I'm not expressing this correctly. I, we should look into this more. We should think think harder on this neutral good because yeah. I think we're I, I'm having we're a, missing I'm having a hard time with a real world uh, person. Sorry, Christians. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm having time with a real world person that that actually fits neutral good. Neutral good is also not an exciting alignment, so it's not typically in movies. No, yeah. it's also the hardest to play. Yeah, I don't know, man. Yeah, I go with lawful good. Mm-hmm. What what else has he been in? Now, how are we saying his last name? I've actually never heard his last name pronounced. Lucas? Yeah, Eric uh, Schweig. Is Schweig. What I use. Yeah, he was in an amazing film called Big. Eden, and if you've never seen Big Eden, it is one of the most adorable and heartbreaking gay love stories I've ever seen in my life. Other than <laughs> all right, know, Brokeback Mountain. But anyway, it's uh he it, if you yes watch Big Eden, it's fantastic. Eric Schweig has also been he's been in a lot of TV shows, okay, uh, including Elementary, Longmire, and Indian Summer, The Oka Crisis. But okay. for movies, uh, he he was also in Gun, the video game. He did a voice <laughs> in that. <laughs> I remember that one. Um, but okay. his, for <laughs> movies, he Big Eden, that was already said, uh, Tom and Huck, he played Injun Joe. Oof, uh. Uh, let's see. He was also in a movie called Pontiac Moon, Squanter, A Warrior's Table, Tale. I remember that. Uh, Last Mohicans, obviously. And he was... In the 1989 TV series of War of the Worlds, he played Daro. Oh, God, that show was so good. Maybe it wasn't. I remember <laughs> so, it being good, but... Uh, he's been yeah. more active okay. in, in television than he has in movies, and he's still active. All right, what other characters we got? 
Then we have Jody May who played Alice Mun- Monroe. Maybe she was neutral good. I would say chaotic good personally. Oh no, I know her alignment. What teenager? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you listen to our show. <laughs> I do listen to your show. She was neutral. She was a sweetheart. She was she was a person put in an impossible situation yeah. that she didn't have the tools to deal with. There's yeah. that. I don't yeah. think that changes her from basic person type hood. In fact, her inability to deal with it kind of cemented her as basic person type hood. Yeah. Sure. I'm going to go right. with lawful good again. All right. Go with that. And then we have Stephen Waddington as Major Duncan Hayward. So oh, before so That's before that, good. so actually Richard E. Grant and Hugh Grant were actually also considered to play this part. I couldn't see Hugh Grant come off as the heavy. God, me either, I just no. couldn't. Yeah. Who was the other Hugh Grant and Richard E. Grant? Richard Don't know who that Grant, is. maybe. 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 But I, I like who they used for 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 Duncan. Oh, yeah, Steve he Waddington was, just owned it. He. I like that he was a little bit puffy. Mm-hmm. He was a little puffy in the face. He was a prick. I did not like that guy. <laughs> yeah. I think he redeemed himself rather well. He, he did at the did. end. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. At the very last minute, everybody's just shocked as shit. We didn't cover that. Go go watch the movie. Watch that bit. It's a good oh, bit. God. That yeah. whole, the whole last, what, 30 minutes of the film? <laughs> it really 20? comes together. It's, oh, my God. It's just, it's just, mes- it's mesmerizing. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then we have your favorite, West Studi. Oh, West Studi. As Magua. Lawful neutral. That's a hard one. I, I don't know on this one. I really don't. I wanted to go lawful good, but I didn't want to have another sneakers fight. <laughs> because by I, his customs and his society, he is doing what's right and lawful. Yep. I can see that. He is a complex character. He's a, yeah. I, I don't know enough to actually pass judgment. Here, here's, here's, here's the thing. We, and, we, we do it because it's our history. And so we we have very d- definitive ideas of what good is and what evil is. Um, in a war like this that took place from one continent to another with people who are vassals and just like it was a really complicated event. W- with a story like his, there is no good and evil in, in this one. Mm. You know, there's just victims of war. I, I hate to sound like the other Hawkeye from fucking MASH. But no, um, I, I, I agree there, with There's that. just all, all this has is victims of war. Yeah. And, and he- He's in no way chaotic. He ba- he bides his time. He could have. He could have. Oh, definitely, will say lawful. Yeah, I would lawful neutral. That's you got to go with neutral because I don't think he's a good person. He may have been at one point in his life, but I don't think he is anymore. Well, here's where you get into the concept of what is good. Yeah. Is that mm-hmm. obeying the precepts of your culture? Is that's, that what makes you good? Or are we going to say, is there an overarching good that all humanity subscribes to? This, once again, yeah. is why D&D alignments are actually bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> people, yeah, people are, actual human beings are more complex than that. Actual human beings are significantly yeah. more complex than the nine scale thing. Yeah, there's yeah. there's cultural considerations, there's situational ethics, and a lot yeah, of complex things. Yeah, that's why things. this one's so hard for me to give people alignments, because... I just gave it, them lawful neutral. I Yeah. That's the closest one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because you feel for him. Yeah, I do. He's the antagonist. You really do. But yeah. every time he talks, you're like, I get it, dude. I'm with you. Yeah. You're just kind of a dick. Well, let's go kill some gray hairs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everyone after this is pretty much, in my opinion, an NPC. Yeah, pretty but much. But I will note that uh, one of my favorite actors, Jean Renault, was the offered Marquis. the role of a General uh, Montcalm. Yeah. And Andy McDowell was also considered for the role of Cora. Yeah. And Brian Cox was was offered the role of Colonel Monroe, mm. but declined it. I think the Marquis was also lawful neutral just in this movie. Just he, in this he, movie? he would be lawful good in historically. But in the context of this movie, he did give uh, Magua the, hey, hey. Go do the thing. You know, the thing I can't talk about thing. Come wait, on, wait, go nudge, do the nudge, thing. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so I'd give him a lawful neutral in this as well. Okay, Matthew, where are we going next? Chingachgook. He is sick and wearied by what has happened. He has watched his, his, his people dwindle to him. He is sitting in a place that used to be his lands, which have been taken over now. Um, he is forced out. He is homeless. He is dispossessed. And he has nowhere to go. However, the Great Lakes are right there. And eventually, within the books, he does make his way to those. 
So we're going to go ahead and say that. So sick and wearied by the war, he goes west, leaving the New York area to see the inland seas, as they were called at the time. Now we call them the Great Lakes. Uh, Nathaniel uh, and Cora accompany him. They set up a base at uh, the shore of the lake and begin to trap and hunt. But the local tribes and the French uh, fur traders are suspicious and then turn hostile, thinking that the savages have captured an English woman and they are going to go save her. They capture her and try her and send her back to the French military in New York. Uh, Hawkeye and his father pursue. I like it. Yeah. Now, the thing is, that's a little cliche, but every one of these books are. Uh, Cora does, is not a returning character. She is his love interest, this book. The next book, new love interest. The next book, new love interest, who he saves from the, you know, the savagery so of the world. So it was a template. He just, it was, it take was the same thing, so much, yeah. change character names, locations, and yeah, print out another book. So I felt a little copy outy about making it a save the girl, but it is within the spirit and the history of the series. So I'm just going to let that one stand. Uh, the French fur traders at the time, we're not peaceful merchants. We are talking big French guys covered in fur, tough. Um, it would be very hard to stop a group of more than like four of them. And yeah, I, I think uh, this would be a, a great pursuit story as they literally retrace their steps back to New York. So we got two characters at least here. We got Nathaniel and we have Chingachgook. Yeah. Who else? That's all I got. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really, that's all that bears to this. Yeah. Well, at least, let's make the, this. Okay, a, okay, so you can do more yeah. because there is the wandering minstrel who <laughs> appears in their stories, but he is such an asshole. I didn't want to bring him up. But let's bring in a soldier. We, we can bring in at least two more. So we can bring in a soldier. Maybe they're accompanied by a soldier for some reason or whatever. But it would be a French soldier. What if it was one of the homesteaders who got mm. home, had nothing else to do, and Nathaniel's like, come with us? Like that guy whose entire family the, was The killed. problem yeah. of seeing that is that uh, I, I just, I honestly felt that Chingachgook would want to be alone. Mm-hmm. Like he would take okay. his immediate family with him, and that's it. I don't, and I don't know the, the specific kind of, cultural traditions of the Mohicans. But I feel like in a lot of, a lot of Native American cultures, at least in like Plains, um, plain, what we used to call Plains Indians, the, the idea was that like once you had kind of served your purpose, there was a point in life where you were more of a burden to your tribe than a help. Yeah. And it was your responsibility and your honor and your privilege to to go off on your own and kind of quietly live out your last days on your own so as not to burden the rest of the tribe. Mm -hmm. And that, and again, I don't, I don't know. That's kind of what I was feeling too. Yeah. Like, I don't know the specific traditions, but I feel like he'd be more like Cora and Hawkeye, you go off, start your family. I'm not going to burden you with, with my presence, I'm yeah. going to go off and die an honorable death alone, or Which something like that. Which leaves us with even less characters. So, yeah. <laughs> um, I just, here, here's the thing I, I saw. Yeah, this is a melancholy movie. It really is. It's such a sad movie, and I really don't think that to play this um, is going to be a happy game. It's it's not going to. We are going to defeat, and we're going to take this this knowledge to the people, and yada yada yada. This is an exploration of the end of a part of humanity. And I think the game needs to reflect that. This isn't, you, you won't use hit points for the rest of this. This isn't, this isn't that kind of feel. This is, this is everything that your people have ever dreamed about dying. Now let's play it at a table with friends. And honestly, you just hit the themes right there. It's melancholy. It's loss. This is a story of doom. Yeah. Change through forces that you cannot control. And sometimes not even comprehend why. Upheaving your entire way of life. And to the point that they bring a finality to your existence. It's depressing. It's it, it's going to have some action. but. Even if you win in the end, you're going to lose so much. Yeah, you've you've lost at the yeah. beginning of this game. That's going to be a hard game to play. <laughs> I've got 
some ideas. In fact, one that I just thought of as you were saying that, and it's a game that I used to have a long time ago. I'm going to start with it. And this one is a game called Polaris. Now, there are two games out there called Polaris. There is a recently released Polaris RPG, which is not the one I'm talking about. This one is from the early 2000s. It is by a fellow named Ben Lehman. It is a storytelling kind of past the stick cooperative storytelling experience about a kingdom that lived in the darkness at the North Pole and then the sun came and then the light came and they had never experienced light before and how it changed everything. And then their society fell apart and was no more. So you tell the story of the fall of their society. But you could reskin that as your home, your way of life. And then the white man came and then everything changed. And now you have to deal with the aftermath of that. I have a game for this, too. What do you have? Uh, Aces and eights. Um, Aces and eights is uh, a little further advanced in years than this era. It's it's an old West game. We mentioned this before. Yeah. On our episode of... uh, Good, the bad, and the ugly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, what Aces and Eights is really good for is that it's it's crunchy, which is bad if you're going to kill the boss and you just want to get, you know, the story moving. But if all you have is the story of how you're passing off your final time, you might be very interested in where you can trade that goat to. <laughs> uh, you might be very interested <laughs> on the dynamics of building a one-room log cabin. You might be very interested and how much in a three crop rotation. These are things that might really interest you. If you wanted if, to play a game in that setting at the time, then yeah. yeah. If, if, yeah. if you are the last member of a dying race that can't, <laughs> that can't bring anything else about, and all you can do is hobbies until you, the birds eventually <laughs> pick you oh. clean, Aces and Eights is the game for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ouch. It doesn't, it's not a very melancholy game, though. It's crunchy. It's a, yeah. And it's got hit points. And this isn't a movie. Yeah. This isn't a game with hit points, which is this is tough because I was all like, "Yeah, Last of the Mohicans." Let's do Last of the Mohicans. And then watching it, I'm like, I'm having a hard time thinking of a game to I go with. I sat for an hour before yeah. I wrote those two little paragraphs. It. I can't imagine what he would do next. Like old old white men would just get a hobby. They would build trains. Hmm. Or they would do something just, you know, dumb, play golf. But what does the the last person of a race of a people do? Isn't that a depressing time? The thing? only God other damn. thing, if we go if we go against what our, our our initial feeling is, is that maybe his sole purpose in life becomes protecting Nathaniel and Cora's future children maybe that then becomes his legacy is ensuring their survival so maybe it becomes like this this journey of all three of them and how he will you know stop at nothing and do anything in order to ensure that they go on his blood is gone but his legacy doesn't have to die right and he does have an adoptive son. My yeah, white didn't son. didn't say a word to him at the end. <laughs> the Mohicans are over. Like he didn't. He was standing right there. He, and did you notice he while, did he, say, while he was spreading the leaves, he was like looking at him. Is this how I do it, dad? Is, is, do, I, do I spread it this way? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh. I mean, it was, it was a thing. I don't, I think it was a kindness of him to take it. And I think he was a kind man. Mm-hmm. But I don't think he sees him as his son. I think Nathaniel sees him as his father, but I don't think he sees him as his son. He did refer to him as my white son. Yeah, but he said white son. Yeah. That's different. This is true. As an adopted kid, Uh, I can tell you it's different. Well, this is my adopted son. Okay. I've got some games to pitch. I don't have a final choice here. There's multiple approaches to this. Knowing your tastes. (laughs) Uh-oh. What was the other depressing movie we really did where we were just like, Ugh. It. oh, yeah, it. <laughs> uh, but that episode is so good. Oh, I thank love, you. I, love, I haven't listened to it since. I, it's so, I love that episode <laughs> simply because you all are so uncomfortable. And apparently I'm just enough of a sadist to be like, <laughs> yeah. 
Well, I know you're a setting guy, Matthew. So yeah. the first one that's on top of my list here is a game called Colonial Gothic. I don't have the book handy. I've got digital versions. It basically We've passed this around before. Yeah. It is a game of it's, it's a very traditional flow game. You know, roll some dice, get a number as high as you possibly can. You've got turn base initiative combat. You've got weapons that do damage. You've got hit points. It's it's a trad game. It's the reason I, I bring it up is that it's set in the colonial times. It covers this whole period and it has weapons, it has stats of, of gear and things that match that period. If you really want to make a character and get it out for this setting, it has an interesting core mechanic in that it uses two 12 sided dice. Who else does that? Is that it? 2d12 it uses 2d12 for its core mechanic. Wow. It's pretty solid. I, I, I really like that approach. Instead of a d20, you roll two dice and you roll two 12 sided dice. You know, it's it's different. It gives you more reasons it's to giving use you those a base D12. of a base twelve, base twenty four numerical system. Yeah. I like that because it divides into itself endlessly. What, it's a solid numbering system. What I don't like about it is, you know, I mean, it's an easy enough game to build a character and play, but it's got to me a difficulty system in it. You know, when you D and D roll a D twenty, you want to get a number or higher. Your difficulty, your DC. The DCs in this are layered. It's two stages. It's a difficulty that you need to meet and a modifier to your action based on how difficulty, how difficult the GM thinks it is. And I don't like that because what it says is the DM can say, okay, you want to perform this task. Well, I think that's difficult. So I'm going to give you your target for this because it's difficult. You need to get a 20 or higher. Okay, but it's difficult. So you're also going to have a negative five to that roll. Why don't you just say it's a 25 or higher then? Because what's the point of and, and the you difficulty? Roll twice? No, you just roll once. Hmm. But I'm like, what's the point of the difficulty double banging you when you could have done the math in advance and made it a lot quicker? Like the GM should have factored that in when they told you the difficulty number. So it's it's so weird. It's just a weird, mm. I, I don't like that because it's really, it gives the GM too much fiat. The GM in a game like this, and in a traditional game, I think the GM should just be able to give you a number. You want to roll and beat that number in a transaction. It's like, well, I don't like you. So the difficulty for this is 20, but also I don't like you. So negative five to the roll. I mean, it just, <laughs> it's just, it's just a dick move in yeah. my opinion. And the system enforces that. Otherwise, it's pretty solid. It's It's got a cool setting. It's the basic same setting that this movie's in, but with monsters in the background, too. So there's, like, werewolves and shit. There you go. Colonial Gothic. Another one, we talked about this in the last episode, is the, <laughs> the Cortex system. <laughs> Specifically, the Cortex that is here in the Firefly rulebook. Uh, we talked about it a lot in the Firefly episodes. It's a very traditional game, but it gives your, char- your ability to make a character that has... Uh, a lot of story hooks built in right into your character sheet. Like you have uh, distinctive things that you can do, or you could have a, a special piece of gear. Like Nathaniel has his gun and that yeah. motherfucker holds onto that gun throughout the whole damn movie. And that's his, like his signature gear or something. So I'm having a hard time pitching this. Now I'm in the state of melancholy. Here's the thing. <laughs> I, here's the thing, bud. I, I, I yeah, I could play the world much better than I could play the story. The world is a fascinating world. It's an upheaval world. Um, it's one of your it, favorite it's, settings, too. Yeah, it's it's a passing from the old into what we think of as our modern way of thinking, and it's a very exciting time. But to play the characters in this is almost impossible. It would be much easier to play a group of militia people just fighting the French. Mm-hmm. Because they did have they did have scouts, they did have irregulars at the time. They did have militias who didn't just stand in line. Well, especially the the, the scene I think about the most, like like gaming, is that scene where the courier is running. Yeah, and they're shooting. They're they're covering his back, and so many twenties. You know, so many. He rolled so many twenties, and just like. We've got to get a message to the other four. Uh, who drew the short straw? Who's the fastest runner? Yeah. 
And what are we doing to try to get him there as a group, as a party group to try to get him through to survive? But then once he gets past 100 yards, we don't, he's on his own. Like, <laughs> Here's another interpretation of that scene. He wasn't rolling 20s. Instead, let's say he was playing a game system that used like luck points and you spend luck points and that lets you do a thing and you just, you just do it. So he's like, oh, well, I've, I've been saving up all my luck points for this. I'm going to spin this one. Got that guy. Spin this one. Got that guy. Spin this one. Got that guy. Spin this one. All right. The next day you're out of luck. You're in jail and you're about to be hung. <laughs> so yeah, it, there was a nice little balance of action there. Yeah. Yeah. Incidentally, that was also a real event. Webb refused to send uh, reinforcements. Oh, was such a heartbreaking scene. Yeah. Webb was a piece of shit. Oh, yeah, he was. In Web fact, uh, being the other general. Yeah. 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 Who, who they sent to for reinforcements. Yeah. That wasn't a, a French lie. That was an actual thing. But yeah, this is this is a tough one. I don't have a I don't I don't personally have a solution. Oh, that's because you'll yeah. never recommend aces and eights. But I, it's it's there. It's I there for you. I don't think aces and eights is the right thing for a last of the Mohicans inspired game. For your follow up, where it's just Matthew in a room alone, role playing. <laughs> This guy. Oh, 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 damn. That just got meta real fast. <laughs> <laughs> Crying about the loss of his people. Did this rolling uh, charts. Uh, <laughs> My crops died. Oh. I'm sure Palladium has a, a lot of notes on that. Aces and Aids is, a, is actually a really interesting game. I, I, I highly have, recommend uh, if you haven't seen it. Don't buy it because it's expensive as fuck, but go flip through it in your uh, friendly local game store. It's actually a very beautiful book. Yeah. Also, I don't have a Palladium game for this. No. I, oh no. God, I don't either. No. Well, that, that feels, feels weird. First. Yeah. They never did a Western. Really? Yeah. They did Rift's New West, yeah. but this isn't it, a Rift's That's Rift for robots, man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I love this movie so much, and I don't want it to be sad things on index cards. Well, it already is now. God damn yep. it. <laughs> well, uh, movies will game. Yes. Thank you for playing. <laughs> Thanks for playing. Uh, anyway, this has been uh, Last of the Mohicans. Excellent. Well, I was Matthew. And I was Dusty. I'm Poppy Beaujolais. Uh, and I'm Nathaniel. And we'll see you all <laughs> next time. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to another episode of our show. We're still pretty new to the scene and we'd love to get your feedback. If you like what you hear, Please leave us a review on iTunes with your thoughts. Good or bad, they really help us get the word out. If you want to say hello, drop us a line on all of the usual social media sites. You can find the links right there in the show notes. You can also leave us a comment on our website at havemovieswillgame.com. We look forward to hearing from you. Have Movies Will Game is a Breakfast Puppies podcast production. And our episodes are distributed under CCBYND 4.0 license. Our opening theme is Rock and Gravel by Sid Valentine's Patent Leather Kids with introductory narration provided by Isaac Scher. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time.